Well, did you have a good Christmas? Everyone have a good Christmas? You know, I think some of the three worst words for parents on Christmas morning are some assembly required. <laughs> we experienced that on our Christmas morning. We have twin grandsons and, and we experienced that. And for kids, the three worst words to hear on, on Christmas morning are batteries not included. <laughs> I don't know if you got caught with that or not, but um, this morning, you know, Pastor Dave has been leading us in this series called Joy Has Come, and we've been going through this series about about how we can have joy, and he's been along the way giving us some of his Christmas finds, and he's been sharing with with us some Christmas gifts that you you can bring. So I thought this morning I would share with you some New Year's resolutions that people have made, okay? These are actual tweets They're actual New Year's resolutions that people have made for 2018, okay? How many of you would like to use the gym more this year, this new year, okay? Can I see your hands? Okay, here's one way you can use the gym more. This is actual tweet. I want to use my gym card more, and there they are using their gym card to cut a Danish roll or whatever. Um, Yeah. Uh, Here's one. Um, How many of you would like to burn more calories in this new year, okay? Here's a way you can do it. Just burn 2,000 calories. That's the last time I'll leave the brownies in the oven while I nap. (laughs) Yeah. This next one is, uh, somebody said, I want to exercise more. But if you look at the parentheses, it says, exercise my right to eat more tacos. (laughs) If you're like me, you'll like, you're attracted to that one. Here's one. My New Year's resolution is to be more assertive, if that's okay with you guys. I don't know if you, how many of you have been guilty of this, but my New Year's resolution is to try and put less than four chapsticks through the washer and dryer this next year. Yeah, or gum or crayons if you're a parent, right? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine sent me this one. He said, I'm going to start writing my book on procrastination as soon as I get around to deciding on a title. <laughs> well, I heard a statistic recently that only 8% of Americans keep their New Year's resolutions after 30 days. That by February, those desires, those resolutions that you and I plan, we're no longer practicing. There's no even resemblance of a New Year's resolution. This morning, I want to talk about taking new territory for God in this new year. And I want to encourage you to to turn to uh, Joshua chapter 1. If you're not there yet. You know, we as a church, as Pastor Dave said, we're planning on taking new territory in this new year as we, Lord willing, move into our new children's and worship center. It's going to be an awesome time together. And um, we are, as a church, as, uh, along with that, we're, we're, we're wanting to take new territory in Patterson and plant a new church through the leadership of Pastor Jeremy and, and see great things happen in that, uh, uh, in that community. But maybe on a personal level, There's some territory that you want to take in this new year. Um, Maybe it's in your finances. And if I can make a shameless plug right now, uh, we're going to have Financial Peace University offered in January. And if you want to do something different than what you've normally done with your finances, this is a great way to do it. It'll start the end of January. Maybe it's in your education or your career or your health, or you want to do something different this next year in your recovery. Um, whatever it is, we're going to look together what it takes to be one of those 8% of Americans. What is it that's going to allow us to, um, to, to be able to fulfill those promise, those resolutions that we made? You know, we see this sign up here, joy. I mean, is it even possible to have joy these days? Is it, is it impossible? Is it possible to enjoy this next year, not just endure it? And we're going to look at a phrase this morning found in Joshua chapter 1 that I want to grab a hold of. It's the phrase, be strong and courageous. Would you say that with me? Be strong and courageous. And I realize that for some people, being strong and courageous means just putting one foot in front of the other and trying to make it through this season in life. That for some of you here this morning, it's a tough time. It's a tough season. And maybe God is saying to you, by being strong and courageous, it simply means Keep doing the right thing. Keep walking. Keep obeying. Keep waiting on me, and I will come through. Maybe you're a single parent this morning, and being strong and courageous means for you that you're going to trust God to provide, and you're going to ask God to help you with those times of loneliness. 
I don't know how God's going to use this phrase, be strong and courageous, but he's used it in my life this week, and I want to share with you some things that um, God told Joshua that we can grab a hold of. What is it going to take to see the rea- uh, those desires become reality? God has a promised land life for each of us that he wants us to move forward into. If we will kind of grab hold of some principles, timeless principles found in his word. And so I'd like to do that by looking at Joshua chapter one, and we're going to read verses one through nine. And I I need a little help this morning, okay? I know we have children in our service this morning, so we're going to do some hand motions, okay? Now, adults, we want to let the kids know it's okay to have fun in church too, okay? So when you hear this phrase, be strong and courageous, I'm going to ask you to do this. Be strong and courageous, okay? Let's practice. Be strong and courageous, all right? So as we read through this this morning, we're going to, whenever you hear that phrase, be strong and courageous, we're going to be strong and courageous, okay? And I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand with me as we read these verses out of Joshua. Let's stand together. Verse one. I know, I know, it's hard, I know, come on, it's okay. (laughs) We don't normally do this, visitors, so anyways. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River to the land that I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set foot, wherever you set foot, you will be, the land, you will be on the land I've given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you shall live. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you nor abandon you. Now here's the first one, ready? Be strong and courageous. You are the one that will lead these people to possess the land that I swore to their ancestors. I would give them. Here's the second one. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions that uh, Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning from either the right or the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Here it is again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, I pray that you'd open up your word to us, that whatever you might need to say to me or to anyone, Lord, that we would just be listening and we would be hearing what you have to say. God, thank you for your word and that it gives us hope. It gives us um, help. God, it gives us healing where we need to be healed. We give you thanks, Jesus, for how you're going to use this time for your glory. In your name we give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. Joshua had every reason to be filled with self-doubt. He had every reason to look at what was ahead of him with a lack of confidence and and be fearful and hesitant and anxious. He had just lost a close friend, a mentor, a leader in Moses. It was Moses who, a little over 40 years before these words were written, led the people of God out of Egypt. God had provided for them time and time again, and then they made it to the border of the promised land, the land that God had uh, promised to give them. Moses decides to send 12 spies into the land and scope it out and see what, what it was like. And 10 of those spies return, and they're skeptical, and they give this negative report, and they say, people are living in the land. Someone else is occupying that land that, we, that God has promised. There's walled cities in the land. There's strongholds that will need to be broken down. There are giants that we'll face if we go into the land. 10 spies said that we can't do it. It's too challenging. There's too many obstacles. But two spies, one named Joshua and the other named Caleb said, yeah, there's giants in the land, but there's a giant upside to going in and taking the land that God has promised to us. Well, instead of believing Joshua and Caleb, the people chose to believe the negative report, and as a result, they spent 40 years wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. As we come to Joshua chapter 1, they're at a point of decision once again. But this time, they're without Moses. 
Would they continue to wander aimlessly and shrink back and play it safe and, and kind of, you know, just live randomly in life? Or would they move forward by faith into the land that God had offered to them? Some of you here today may be like that. You may be on the border of something big for God. Maybe you're, you're on the border of crossing that line of faith and giving your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're on the border of doing something daring with your life or trusting God or stepping out in faith to see something great happen. But fear and anxiety have kept you from acting on your faith in God. The paralysis of analysis has kept you living in fear and anxiety rather than strength and courage. In his book, Anxious for Nothing, author Max Licato says, the United States is now the most anxious nation in the world. He says that the land of stars and stripes have become the country of stress and strife. So the question I want to ask this morning, is there a better way? I mean, is it even possible as we look at this new year to be strong and courageous? I mean, we look at our government and how divided our government is. We, we look at our world. We, we hear about terrorism or North Korea or ISIS. Is it really possible to believe that we can be strong and courageous in a world of chaos? Well, I believe that there are some things that God told Moses or Joshua in this first chapter of Joshua that if we can grab hold of, I believe they're timeless principles that they can help us no matter what we face, no matter what's ahead of us in this new year, we too can be strong and courageous. So would you take some notes this morning? The first one is this. If we realize this, first and foremost, I have his purpose to live for. I have his purpose to live for. Look at verse one. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. God is saying to Joshua, Joshua, this is why I spared your life 40 years ago. This is what I've been preparing you for in the wilderness. Maybe you've been in the wilderness recently. God is using that time, that time of waiting and wondering to, to prepare you for something. But when I recognize God, I have God's purpose to live for, that's what I get out of bed in the morning for, not my own. I can, learn to, uh, the, I can be strong and courageous. Well, the question is, what is God's purpose for my life? You know, our mission as a church is to love people one step closer to Jesus. You hear that quite frequently here at New Life. And we believe that for our children, we believe that for our students and our adults, our life groups, our classes that we offer. We want to see people take one step closer to Jesus. But as important as that is, that is not God's ultimate purpose for our lives or our church. Some might say, well, our, God's ultimate purpose is our salvation, to rescue us and to forgive us. And as important as that is, that is not God's purpose, ultimate purpose for us. Maybe it's serving, you know, being nice to people. That's not God's ultimate purpose for our life. God's ultimate purpose is not our satisfaction that we would be happy. God's ultimate purpose is not our safety. It is not our success. Then what is it? Look at the verse in your outline there, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. That's a great verse to keep in mind on New Year's Eve, by the way. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You see, God's ultimate purpose for our lives is that we would glorify him, that he would be glorified. And God can do that by blessing us, and in return, we say thank you, we, re we glorify him. He can do it by using us, he can do it by choosing us in salvation. But God can also be glorified through our brokenness, can't he? And through our suffering and our pain and our loss. You see, God's ultimate purpose in our life is that he would receive the glory, not me. If we ever lose sight of that, friends, as a church or on a personal level, we're in trouble. That it's really ultimately not about me. It's about God, isn't it? Joshua, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. And when you live for God's purpose and you give him the glory, you will find meaning and fulfillment in every other area of your life. And you'll find that strength and courage beginning to rise. 
There's a second thing that God says to Joshua in this chapter or these verses. In verses three through five, he says, if we realize this, I have his promises to live on. I have his promises to live on. Look at verse three. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot will be the land that I've given you. And then he gives them the parameters of that land from the Negev wilderness in the south, the Lebanon mountains in the north, the Euphrates River in the east, and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Just as God gave Joshua some promises, he has given you and me promises as well to take new territory and new ground for him. Someone has said that there are 7,000 promises in the Bible. Promises to discover, promises to claim. And a long time ago, when I went through a dark period of my life, I read um, a, a devotion by a man named Warren Wiersbe, and he said this. He says, as God's people, we do not live by explanations. We live by the promises of God. Friends, there are a lot of things in life we can't explain. There are a lot of things we don't understand. This past week, I had a funeral for a 28-year-old young, uh, young man. At the same time, a, a, man, a young man that was in our church in Tracy when we were there, a CHP officer was sitting on the side of the road, and a guy plowed into him and killed him, leaving him with three, uh, his wife with three young children. I don't understand those things. I can't explain those things, friends. 33 years old. But we don't live by explanations. We live by the promises of God. Can I share with you one promise that God gave me when I went through a dark time in my life? It's Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says this, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. That verse became so meaningful to me when I was going through a time knowing that God would hold me even when I thought I couldn't hold it together myself. And I want to encourage you to do one thing. I want to encourage you to find a promise of God that you can claim in this new year. Maybe it's Isaiah 41.10. Maybe it's something like Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to encourage you to grab hold of a promise from God and just claim it this new year. See what happens. I have his promises to live on. I have his purpose to live for. And thirdly, in verse six, I have his people to live with. Look at verse six. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one that will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. I have his people to live with. A few chapters earlier, Moses says to Joshua in De Deuteronomy chapter 31, he called Joshua and he said, in all of Israel, he said, be strong and courageous, for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors that he would give them. You're the one that will divide it among them as grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never fail you nor abandon you. God is telling Joshua, Joshua, you're going to take this new territory, but you're going to do it with others in your life. You're not going to do it by yourself. There's going to be a group of people that you need to do this with. Have you ever been to the movies recently? Have you, can I see your hands? Have you been to the movies recently? Okay, we were part of that Christmas Day crowd that uh, went to the movies. <laughs> we struggled to find parking, and uh, we got in line with the rest of the people and got to the front and found out our movie was sold out and that we were, there was no room. We were going to have to come back later. And uh, we, we came back later, and we had to, you know, get through all the crowd, and we sat down, and the lights lowered, and the, you know, the previews, the, the 45 minutes of previews you know, went on. And, um, and as I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know what? Church can be a lot like going to the movies. I mean, you struggle to find a parking spot, right? <laughs> you know, you come in, you don't really know a whole lot of people other than maybe somebody you came with, you know, and you, you, you fight through the crowd and you, you fight to find a seat and, you, and the lights lower and, and the show begins, you know, and, uh, and maybe you find yourself singing if it's a musical movie, you know, you're singing along with, or, or maybe you laugh, or maybe you cry during the show, and then it ends. And you file out, and you get in your car, and you go home. And for some, that's what church is like on a, on a weekend. But you know, something unique happened to me that day at Christmas Day when we went to the movies. As I was leaving, 
uh, I noticed I didn't have my keys with me. And so I went back to the section I was sitting at, and there was a bunch of people still there at the end of the movie, and uh, I got my flashlight app out, you know, and I'm looking underneath the seats and so forth, and I look up, and there's about four or five people with flashlight apps. They're all helping me look (laughs) for my keys. And um, something unique happened. The crowd turned into a community. And one guy said behind me, he says, I've done this before in a movie theater, and he's trying to make me feel better, and it really wasn't working a whole lot, but I really appreciated what he said, and so we're looking for the keys, we're trying to find them, and I was ready to give up, I really was. And finally, somebody, one of the guys with the flashlight app said, what's that? Well, in between the theater seats, there's this little ledge, okay? And my keys had dropped down on that ledge. I was looking all over the floor and couldn't find them. Friends, I would have never found those keys without some help. And when you go through the times of loss in your life and you go through times where you can't understand and you can't figure things out, you cannot do it by yourself. You need others in your life to journey with you. That verse in your outline there, it was a verse that we read in our men's Bible study on Tuesday mornings as we started the book of Romans. It's written by Paul and he says this, when we get together together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. And I thought to myself when I read that verse, that's what life groups are about. That's what community is about. It's being encouraged by others and it's encouraging them that when you go through times where you have a hard time figuring life out, people can help support you and vice versa. Those of you who are in recovery know that you can't fight this battle on your own. You need other people in your life supporting you, encouraging you, keeping you accountable. You know, some people have wondered, um, Jim, why are you so passionate about groups? Why are you so passionate about life groups? Why do you feel so strongly that every person at New Life should be in a group of some kind? Well, first of all, I think it's biblical, okay? Okay. I think in Acts chapter two, when the church first started, they met publicly like we are this morning, but they also met in homes. They also met in smaller groups. And we don't just believe in rows at New Life, we believe in circles as well. But another reason is I can't believe that people can, how they can deal, I can't imagine how people can deal with the stress and anxiety of life without God and and his people in their life. Can I say this as someone who loves you? If you are too busy to connect into community of some kind, if you're too busy to get into a life group, you're too busy. Because God created you for community. He wired you for fellowship. He wired you to be known and to know. He wired you to be loved and to love others. He wired you to celebrate and, and celebrate others. I have his people to live with. I can be strong and courageous. Even when my faith is weak, even when I'm struggling, I can be strong and courageous because there's other people around me praying for me, supporting me, lifting me up when my faith is weak. A fourth thing that we need to realize is in verses seven and eight, and it's this. It's not only do I have God's people to live with, but I have his principles to live by. Look at what it says in verse uh, seven. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all all the instructions that Mo, uh, Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning them either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you, be pros- you, you, will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Friends, that's the only place in the Bible that the word prosper is used, is here. And if you want to prosper and succeed, it says we got to get into God's word. We got to meditate on God's word. We got to remember God's word. The fourth thing is this. I have to, uh, I have his principles to live by. That word meditate, would you circle that word? That word literally means to mutter. It's like a low sound. As you go through your day, you kind of mutter God's word. The Latin word for mutter, or the Latin word for meditate is the word ruminate. Does anybody know where the word ruminate comes from? It comes from a cow chewing its cud. And as best as I understand it, the reason a cow chews its cud is because there's several chambers in a cow's stomach. 
And so what it does is the cow will go out to the field and it'll graze, it'll eat some grass, and then it'll sit down uh, in the field and it'll, and it'll chew on it, okay? And uh, that's why you see the cow, you know, doing this, you know? And then it'll go down a little bit further and it'll, and, and it'll bring it back up and chew on it. Friends, that's what it means to meditate, okay? We, we, we feed on God's word, we, we look at God's word, we read God's word, and then, okay, you, got, you guys gotta do this, okay? Okay, one, two, three, ready? Okay, you do that and you chew on God's word. Now, you might wanna say, tell the person next to you, say excuse me when you do that, but... Um, so when you and I meet, and we meet in the hallway and we do that, you know what that means, okay? But that's what meditate is, okay? It means that I, I get into God's word, I read God's word, and I remember it as I go through my day. You know why I think it is that people fail to keep their New Year's resolutions? They don't review them. They don't remember them. They don't think about them. The same is true with God's word. In your worship folder, we put together a little reading plan called Five by Five by Five. This reading plan will help you read through the New Testament in a year. It's five minutes a day, five days a week, and there are five ways that you can remember and meditate on what you read um, throughout the day. Now, if you want to take this to a whole other level, I encourage you to do this. Find somebody else who wants to do this reading plan and then every day, text that verse. You read your chapter, and you text the verse to the person, uh, the, the one verse that stood out to you. I'm doing this with two other men in our church right now, and I have to tell you, there are times they get up at like 3.30 and 4 o'clock in the morning, and there's mornings I get up, and I, I, I don't need to do my Bible reading, and I see those texts on my phone. And I say, wait a minute. Uh, if they're doing it, I need to do it. This will take, help you take you to a whole nother level, Okay. Also, this weekend, if you need a Bible, we have some complete Bibles that we want to give you if you need a Bible, okay? If you'll stop by starting point as you leave this morning and just tell them, I'd like a Bible, we have the New Living Translation, that's the version that Pastor Dave speaks from, we want to get a Bible into your hands. So if you have a reading plan and God's Word, you have a plan. Can I share with you um, another gift that God's given to the church it's an app that you can download on your phone called YouVersion. If you don't have this app on your phone, you need to get this app. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And when you download that app, you can read any part of the Bible in any version you want. And um, there are some reading plans, the five, seven-day reading plans, like if you're struggling with anger or depression or you know, whatever, your marriage, there's reading plans that you can go through. Now, what's so helpful to me is I have ADD, okay? And so I can get distracted really easy. What I will do on this app is there's an ability to listen, okay, to what's being read. So I will take a chapter and I will listen while, while the guy reads the chapter. It helps me stay focused. And then I'll find that verse that's important to me and I'll text it to my two, my two buddies. That has helped me so much to meditate and remember and, you know, do whatever you need to do to and chew on God's word, okay? Can I show you one way that I meditate on God's word? Um, this is a picture of my dash, okay? And you may not be able to read that verse, but it's about anger, being slow to become angry. Because I am one of those people that struggle with, you know, the maniacs on the road, okay? I'm just being honest. And um, that verse has helped me. Okay, to review it and to remember it and to think about it. Now, sometimes I'll change that verse out and I'll put a different verse in, but that has helped me so much to keep it before me, okay? So just get a three by five index card, write a verse out and put it somewhere where you'll remember it and see it. See what happens. I have God's principles. Friends, this is God's syllabus for success. If we want to live a successful life, we need to get into God's word. And even more importantly, we need to get God's word into us. Look at what Psalm 119 verse 9 says. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Verse 11 of Psalm 119 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Friends, you will not always have a Bible with you, but you can have God's word with you wherever you go. 
And you do that by getting into God's word and meditating on God's word and remembering his word. I have God's principles to live by. Friends, there's not a specific verse, chapter and verse for every situation you're gonna face in life. But there is a principle from God's word that will guide you, okay? And you need to get into God's word to find those principles so that when you go through those specific situations, you have a guiding principle that will guide you. The last thing is this in verse nine. It's this, I have his presence to live in. I have his presence to live in. Look at verse nine. He says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, if you're like me, if we didn't read verse nine, it didn't have verse nine, this would be kind of like a motivational speech that God gave to Joshua. Sounds a little bit like a speech one of my coaches gave, you know, when I was playing sports. You gotta be strong and courageous out there. But then he includes verse nine. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged. You see, there'll be times of testing and challenge and warfare when you move forward for God. But God is with you wherever you go. These promises didn't keep the Israelites from tough times, but it did determine whether they would be strong and courageous in the, midst, in the face of them. I want to show you something very interesting as we close our time this morning. Notice the, the three uses of be strong and courageous. I, I found this fascinating. The first one says this, be strong and courageous. The second one says, be strong and very courageous. Verse nine says, be strong and courageous. And in the original language, there's an and there. And do not be afraid or discouraged. Now, I wondered why it is that God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Then he said, be strong and be very courageous. Then he said, be strong and courageous and don't be discouraged or uh, or, or afraid. Friends, there are times in your life when your courage meter, your strength meter is going to be about half full. And God's going to say to you, be strong and courageous. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to be very courageous. When you're going to be like a racehorse in a gate that wants to bolt out and do something big and bold for God. But there's going to be also times in your life when you're struggling with discouragement. And God's word to you is simply, be strong and courageous. And wherever you're at in this life, wherever you're at in your life, God says, be strong and courageous. If your tank is half full this morning, be strong and courageous. If it's full, be very courageous. If it's empty, be strong and courageous. See, I think what God is saying to Joshua in all of this, would you take note of this? This, I think, is the the main thing that God is trying to say to Joshua and to us. It's this. When we recognize God's presence, we it releases God's power to be strong and courageous. When we recognize God's presence, he says to Joshua, I'm with you. Don't ever forget that. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. And when we recognize God's presence, it releases God's power to be strong and courageous. When our kids were growing up, we would um, pile all five kids into a van, a minivan, and we would take off for vacation And because we didn't have a pool, a lot of times we'd find a motel that had a pool. And um, there'd be times where the kids would like, wanted to go swimming, and Elizabeth, my wife, and I, we would go down and we would sit by the pool. And when our kids saw us there, they would say things like, Dad, Dad, watch this. And pretty soon, you know, they do this thing where they dive in the deep end or they do this crazy thing. Then they get out of the water and they'd say, Dad, Dad, watch this. And they probably do the same thing, a little bit, you know, a little bit different. And I mean, they must have done that 20 times. Have you ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? What would happen if we realized our Heavenly Father was watching us? What kind of courage, what kind of bravery, what kind of strength would we have? What kind of things would we attempt if we knew our dad, our Heavenly Dad, was watching us? Would it make a difference? I think it would. And when I have his presence to live in, and I have his power to live in, I can be strong and courageous no matter what I face. Friends, the thing I don't, I, want, I don't want you to hear this morning is that this is about living in our own strength. We believe here at New Life that life, strength is found in surrender. 
We believe that life is found in surrendering those areas of our life and giving those things to God and allowing him to work. Would you take note of this? If I try to live this Christian life on my own strength, I will either become one of two things. I will either become conceited or defeated. Either pride or discouragement will set in. If I think that somehow I can be strong and courageous in my own strength, I will become either conceited or defeated. No, it's not about us. It's about the Lord working in us, empowering us, strengthening us, encouraging us. Years later, there would be another man named Joshua that would be born. And he too would lead a group of people into a new way of life. He would eventually give his life so that others might live. And he did it to provide forgiveness and hope. This man named Joshua came that... We might not just survive those things in life, but we might thrive. Because you see, the Greek word in the New Testament for Joshua is the word Jesus. And the great thing about knowing Jesus and having a personal relationship with him is that every day is a new year. It's a new beginning. It's a new start. And we can be strong in our loss and our loneliness and our stress, our success, when we realize I have his purpose to live for. I have his promises to live on. I have his people to live with, his principles to live by, and his presence to live in. Will you be strong and courageous and trust God for some new territory in this new year? Let's pray together. I want to invite you in the quietness of this moment to somewhere in your outline, somewhere in your notes, Just jot down one thing that you want to trust God for in this new year. One area. One thing you want to ask God, help me, God, to be strong and courageous. Whatever it is. Just take a moment as we stand at the threshold of this new year to say, Lord, I want to trust you for this in my life. I'm asking you to help me take new territory for you. Why? so that you would be glorified. You would receive the glory. Father, if there's anyone here that does not know you and doesn't have that relationship with you, I pray that they would understand that how much you love them and how much you, you desire for them to be in relationship with you. And Father, that all begins as we surrender our lives, our issues, our brokenness, our hurts, habits, and hangups to the only one that can heal us. Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the work you've done this past year in our lives and in our church. Thank you for what you want to do in this next year. We commit ourselves, our families, our church, this next year to you, Jesus. In your name we give thanks. Amen.